Okay, thank you everybody for joining today. Oh, now I've never mentioned I've got all the cameras covering half the screen now. <laughs> um, today I'm going to be talking about this project we've started this year called uh, The Factory Must Grow Automation in Factorio. So this kind of sprung from um, a silly idea. Um, when I finished my PhD, I, I, you know, during your PhD, you kind of have to follow the projects uh, thoroughly. You don't have much space to, to explore outside of the strict bounds of your project. At least, at least that was the case for me because I work with industry. So I always said when I finished my, my PhD, I'd love to be able to explore projects that have nothing to do with what I did before. And that's what this was. This is how this began. Um, so Factorio is a video game. Um, which is basically uh, a simulation of real world factories in a sci-fi setting um, is the way I like to put it. Um, I managed to encourage and uh, persuade all those names on the screen to join me on this project. Um, and their expertise has been incredibly useful. Um, it really has been a team effort um, for what we've done so far. Um, and this title, The Factory Must Grow, is, that's the name of our first paper that we're writing just now. It's very almost complete and I'll explain further. Um, so we are very much an early stage of the project. The project itself is um, rather expansive and it covers various ideas and problems across, I would say, multiple disciplines. Um, this paper we're working on right now is really only a proof of concept of one problem, never mind the myriad of problems that comes with the project. So this is very preliminary um, and we actually don't have results for this yet. I just wanted to kind of talk about where we are in this project and, and share it with, with Beacon and see how people you know, uh, reacted to it and maybe hear some feedback on where we're going with this project because um, I think it kind of grew arms and legs about what we initially wanted to do and where we eventually start going. So um, to describe what Factorio is is actually really difficult. It's such a complex uh, set of problems within a game that I don't feel like people believe me when I tell them how complex this is. Uh, I truly don't. Um, so what I thought would be a really good introduction is, uh, this is the trailer for Factorio's launch. Um, so this game was actually in uh, sort of like a beta release for the past four years. Um, and they, the development team are fantastic. They've been putting out constant updates every single Friday for four years of their software development cycle and what they've been doing to improve things. And they're very community oriented, which was really, really appreciated because it gave a lot of insight into how they created the game. Um, in August this year, they actually finally did their final launch of Factorio 1.0. Um, and this trailer gives a nice overview of the various things that you can do in Factorio and touches slightly on the development of the game as well, which um, is, is kind of of interest. So I'm just going to hit play here. It all started eight years ago with an idea for a game about automation. A game where you build a factory, defend it, optimize it and scale it to insane sizes. A game full of machines, transport belts, robotic arms, trains, flying robots and so much more. The idea became a prototype. The prototype turned into an early access game. And now, at long last, Factorio is ready to launch. So that's, a, that's their very brief trailer of, of the 1.0 release. And I hope you saw on the screen that there was a huge number of things interacting on the screen. Lots of machines, lots of mechanisms transporting items back and forth. There was these robots that were carrying items and constructing objects on your behalf. They're automated, so you give them sort of schedules or things that they must do. Um, and there's, there's certain requirements for all this to work. The machinery requires electricity, so you must think about the logistics behind passing electricity, you must produce and generate electricity. Um, and all of these separate problems, they're all technical optimization problems, are interlinked. And let's go into, let's go into a little bit detail about that. And that's how this is research. It's kind of a hard question because I, I find that when we talk about video games, people immediately go, oh, that's not research. That's, you want to play a game, that's all you want to do. But <laughs> no, I, I truly do believe this is a treasure trove of optimization problems that has not really been touched yet. Um, we did some literature review um, already, and there are a couple of papers talking about Factorio, but so far all they've been talking about is uh, in-game economies from an economical standpoint. Um, and somebody put forward an idea of optimizing it in a poster that never did anything with it several years ago. So um, it's very much a novel set of problems that really haven't been touched yet. 
So I've, here's an example of a few of the problems in, in game that you'll see. Um, for example, here we have materials getting transported in, and then you want to split them from one you know, uh, direction to another and from uh, one number of belts to another number of belts. Um, like that, um, this is iron ore and coal ore, if you're interested, getting put together and split again. Um, we also have some kind of classical problems in computing science, which is this railway logistics here. Um, you'll see there's a deadlock on the left, right? If the trains are not properly scheduled and properly controlled, they can actually cause a deadlock, which will, um, if you imagine that in the real world, you know, trains stopping on a train track could be full of materials or oil or, or people, uh, it can be a very, very much, um, you know, reduced production and efficiency if that kind of thing happens. So a smart system is required, like on the right-hand side, which is arguably not very efficient because some of the trains have to wait longer than others. Um, so these kind of uh, logistics are, are, are a large part of the optimization in Factorio. On a higher, more abstract level, you can also think about train scheduling, not just at a single junction, but overall, um, what does a train have to do? When does it have to do it? What conditions does it need to do certain things and go places? So on the screen, we're looking at the menu in game um, where you could, it, this is for one single locomotive and you're telling it um, to go up to the area where uh, copper ore is being mined, stay there until your cargo is full, then traverse back to the area where you will unload the copper ore, probably so it can be smelted into the next stage uh, until your cargo is empty which is a fairly simple setup. But if you have dozens of trains that are using dozens of lines um, and possibly dozens of stations or hundreds of stations even, it becomes a very, very complex problem. And that's only one part of the working mechanism that is factorial. This one, I'm not gonna go into too much detail because it gets, it gets heavy. Um, on the left is an example of a player created nuclear power plant. Um, so there are several machines that exist in the game in the, in the base game with no modification. Um, steam engines, um, there are tankers which you can, can hold steam or oil, um, there's uh, nuclear power generators in the center there that um, create heat that passes into the water, turns into steam, which turns the turbines, which generates electricity. Um, you also have to store this electricity if you have an overload, and if you have too little, you might actually um, prevent your, your, uh, your entire base from doing anything, you'll have a brownout. Um, because you, you might need electricity to then pass the materials required for nuclear energy to be created in the first place. It's, it's, so you need to have enough, enough energy to continue making energy, technically. On the right-hand side is an idea of the production in-game. Um, so if, you're, if you've been playing for, for, this is for one hour's worth on screen, um, you can see there's hundreds of thousands of items being created at a time. Now you might think, how is this possible by a single player to manage all this? And that's the whole point of having robots and machines is that they do the, the, the actual work for you. Your job is effectively to manage yourself out of existence. By the end of the game, the factory should be running without any, you doing anything, ideally. At the beginning, it's very manual. You must go collect uh, uh, resources yourself. But by the end of the game, it should be entirely hands-off. You're automating yourself out of usefulness. Uh, every AI researcher's worst dream. <laughs> Decision-making is another massive part of Factorio. On the left is um, a user on, on Reddit posted this. Um, that's his, that was his plan for what to do next in the next few hours of playing Factorio. And he wanted to discuss the idea with some of his friends online. Um, on the right-hand side is a de decision graph um, of what you need before. You, it's kind of like a Gantt chart, what you need to do in order to do something else next. Um, and the, the difficulty here is on the left, the the, the the human is thinking kind of abstractly of what he plans to do over the hours. On the right, it's more of a, um, what is currently available based on our current resources. In the next second, this would change because every time we get new resources or lose resources for building, the decisions that are available change and become more. So that's the, another part of the huge complexity here, right? You have all these problems and you can decide which ones to solve, which ones should be solved, which ones can be solved. So, Here's a bit of context about how this, all these various problems um, fit into the real world. Um, Factorio is a video game that emulates a myriad of real world problems. At least this is the way I see it as somebody with operational research um, training. Um, and it's in a sci-fi setting, of course. So there's a little bit of silliness there. A small list of problems are below. So on the left, I, I put the sort of more traditional computing science problems as I see them. There's scheduling problems, there's vehicle routing problems with time windows, because you have to consider various drop-offs along the way. Um, at certain times and such. 
many objective optimization. If you're not just considering two or two or three, you might be considering dozens of things at a time. It's definitely many objective. Um, bin packing, if you're trying to transport materials from one side of the map to another, what's the most efficient way to do it? Is it by trains? Is it by robots? What's, you need to make these decisions as well. Um, decision making in general, uh, logic gates, multimodal optimization, and so on. On the right is more of the real world stuff, which is what I'm really interested in here, is how this is so analogous to real world problems. And I think that if we can solve these problems inside a video game, um, we can test certain solutions inside a video game and see how that, that works in a, in a more complex environment than is usually simulated. Um, electrical network management, for example, defense, production planning, uh, cost reduction, fluid handling is another big part of the game. You have oils that are cracked into other types of oils, uh, into lubricants and into heavy oils, light oils, and so on. Um, there's a pollution mechanism in the game. So the more um, the more pollution you create through uh, certain machinery, for example, if you burn a lot of coal, which you might need for energy production earlier on in the game, um, you produce a lot of pollution. And how the game reacts to that and how it punishes you uh, is through the, the aliens, the enemies in the game. They evolve themselves and become stronger the more polluted they are. They also become more aggravated the more polluted they are. So the further you progress in the game, the more the alien natives, I guess, really, you're the one invading their planet, the more the aliens um, get aggravated, the more frequently they attack your base, so the more defense you need, which in turn means you need more machinery and more production, which usually increases pollution. However, there are some items in the game that reduce pollution. For example, if you choose to be less efficient with your energy um, and stop burning coal and instead replace it with solar power, um, you, there's almost no pollution. However, you need to produce a lot more materials to do that. So these kind of, these kind of optimizations are part of it. And uh, I think I'm hoping that you guys can see the connection to the real world here and how um, Factorio could actually be modified. You can modify the base game quite easily to include um, more realistic pollution elements. So if we wanted to get rid of this whole idea of aliens and replace it with something else, um, we could do that fairly easily and then explore this as a simulation for production in the real world. Um, also a very important element of the game is research with prerequisites. Um, if you decide to create solar panels in the game, uh, you can't just do that immediately. You have your, your character, your engineer needs to actually do research in the game to calculate how to do certain things. Um, and to do that, you need to produce a number of uh, materials to get there. So kind of regardless of what you do, there's going to be some kind of cost uh, related to unlocking the, the research. Um, even if you want to, for example, reduce pollution, you need to get there first. Your understanding of how to reduce pollution must be reached first. I guess it's arguably like us running simulations on our, on our HPC. Um, even if we're doing it to, for an environmentally friendly cause, we're still causing, you know, we're still polluting with carbon whenever we run simulations, even if it's for a good cause in the end. It's kind of analogous to that. Um, and I think that has some, some merits to, to real world problems as well. But the most interesting part of Factorio, and this is really where I want this project to go, um, every one of the problems I've mentioned, they're all interconnected and all interdependent. So even if you solve one problem, one very specific sub problem to optimality, you might then fail another one because of that. So you need to have this, um, really, really careful um, interpretation of these various problems and solve them with consideration to each other. The problems are actually solvable to feasibility by humans. The video game is created for people to play after all. Um, usually with a few hundred hours of experience, I say, if you play, if you play when, for the first time, you'll likely fail because that's the nature of video games and the, the nature of challenges when you first try. Um, however, solving to optimality, I think it's arguable that no human has ever done that because no matter how well we design it, there's gonna be some uh, kink along the line, which is you know, preventing the whole thing from being optimal. Um, some poor decision or um, some inefficient placement of an item. So how do we actually define this problem? Because defining something that's so complex is really difficult. Uh, the defining of a problem is, in my opinion, more difficult than actually solving a problem. Um, so in this stage, we define everything as in two sort of big bags, one being decision-making and one being optimization. Or in other words, optimizing is how do we solve the problems um, as well as we want to, to, to optimize the, which problems we want to solve. This is massive and we can divide this into hundreds of sub problems. Um, before investigating, we actually want to do this whole project as a single paper. Um, 
he quickly realized after about 25, 26 pages of, of trying to uh, loosely define some things that this was not possible. Um, it, it, I don't think it'd fit into a textbook, honestly. We now realize that this spans multiple disciplines and is definitely a full project. Um, the disciplines we think this could involve uh, are education. Um, I think video games are inherently uh, linked into education, especially with the fact that people who first start playing Factorio are much worse than those who are performing in the video game than those who've played a long time. Um, I'd love to see the comparisons between an AI learning and a human learning the video game at the same time and compare the two. Um, so I imagine there'll be elements that the human is better at, uh, maybe, maybe more an abstract understanding of, of the various problems, for example. Um, whereas the, an AI might be better at, well, properly solving to optimality sub problems. Um, psychology, again, similar sort of things. You think about how the human, how the human thinks about solving problems compared to an AI. Uh, environmental sciences, I mentioned this, the pollution aspects of this video game. Um, I think that could be easily linked into the environmental sciences. Operational research is kind of the, the, the spine of this whole project. Um, evolutionary sciences, the aliens themselves evolve. Uh, as well as do the optimizers that we will hopefully be using on this. And probably That's many, huge. many more. Um, like I said, the scale of this is massive. And I, I still think that even, maybe even after five papers down, we'll still barely scratch the surface of Factorio. So Kenneth? Yes, please. Uh, do you want questions as you go? Or do yeah, you yeah, want- Yeah, that's fine, yeah, please. Okay, just because, um, so in, in talking about how an AI might be good at some aspects and a human might be better at others, there, there's the issue that what a lot of games um, in order to recognize any kind of progress, you have to be at least okay at a, at a whole bunch of different skills. And if there are any that the AI simply can't do, it might be challenging to get, any, get enough progress to even recognize that there are parts that the AI is successfully doing. I don't know if you've thought much about that sort of issue. No, you're it's absolutely correct. Hard things uh, with games. You're, you're completely correct. Uh, the, I think every, the idea of eventually automating the whole game is kind of like the grand design and the, the, the ultimate goal. Um, right now, we're just testing the grounds, and, and you know, if we do, if we do get to the point where it is actually impossible to have um, multiple optimizers built upon each other, almost dependent on each other, if that does fail, then we'll have learned a lot along the way, and I think we can still produce. Um, we can probably optimize some parts of the game, if not the whole thing, and that's okay well, too. I mean, one of the big research areas now that I that I know at least uh, NSF and DARPA have been putting a ton of money into has been um, human AI interaction and how to build AIs that will really augment the areas that humans are weakest at without needing to be good at everything. And I think that seems like the perfect sort of direction for a game like this, where the areas that you're sh that, that a human is weak at, you have the AI focus on and co constantly feed advice, where the human still maintains control of the big picture until the AI can get to a point that it, that it can grasp a big picture in some sense. Thank you very much for that. That's a good point. And that's why I'm saying that the scale of this, I think, is is immense. And that's another that's another one that can absolutely be added on here. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, I have. I have. Uh, if, when you talk about evolutionary purchase to all this, I have plenty of other ideas on what you could do there too. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards if you're interested. Sure. Great. Um, okay. So how do we start defining a solution without all these various problems? Um, but once we've prepared solutions to, which means to also defining every single one of the problems, um, we'll then first only aim for feasibility. So once we have all these optimizers kind of working in the project um, and they're all kind of leaning on each other in order to survive uh, to some kind of stability, how we define feasibility is thus at the moment. Um, no brownouts to, in other words, prevent power outages once power is initially produced. When you begin, you're just an engineer running around the surface without any power, so that's that's fine. So once you do first have power, you should never then run out, ideally. No resource depletion. So sometimes if you're mining a, a, a stem of iron ore, for example, it might run out, and that's fine. But if you rely on that for the functioning of your factory for many other things, the whole factory can fall over. So what you need to do is uh, uh, estimate when that, that, that iron ore patch might run out and find another and begin um, utilizing that instead. Survivability as well. So <laughs> with the aliens that are still in the game, we don't know if we're gonna tackle them or not. They, they, they do seem like a bit silly and not really analogous to the real world. Um, but 
survivability in general, uh, making sure the factory actually can continue for whatever reason um, is important, especially if the aliens do attack. We need to, if everything gets destroyed, you've definitely failed the game. Um, and we realized at this point, we thought that would be a fine example of, of a good solution, just being able to survive pretty much. Um, but we realized that standing still would actually achieve this um, because the aliens don't attack you if you're not polluting. So if you do nothing, you technically win the game. <laughs> so we decided that progress is actually required as, as, a, as a good solution. Um, that the end goal of the game is technically to launch a rocket. That is technically the final goal. Um, however, I don't, I, honestly, I don't see that as being, a, being possible. I think that level of all these optimizers relying on each other and getting to that final stage that often can be 10, 15, 20 hours of game time. I think that's going to be really unlikely um, at, at the moment. I hope I change my mind. But that's why I feel like at the moment. Okay, um, so beginning design implementation, we've got all these ideas of problems and solutions. How do we actually begin thinking we're solving at least one of them? Um, and what we need to do first, one of the big challenges we realized is that we don't actually have any way to interface with the video game. Like how do we tell the video game what to do? How do we communicate with the game and tell it? How do we allow optimizers to function upon the game? The initial idea was, well, People usually play with keyboard and mouse. So can we just emulate the keyboard and mouse and let the, you know, let some software control the engineer directly? I mean, that's useful because it's a standard input. So we'll likely have very few technical issues on the factorial side. That'll that'll be that should work fine. Um, the downside is it'll be very slow, not only to train uh, a bit of software to, to control the engineer. I think that would be its own paper in itself, to be honest. Um, that adds difficulty. We want to optimize the problems. We don't want to care. We don't really care about controlling a character on the screen. That does not matter to us. Um, so we decided instead that we can communicate via a mod. For anybody who's familiar with video games, mod is just short for modification. Um, Whoop, who's the company behind Factor, who actually provide an API to interact with the game via the programming language Lua. Um, that's actually really, really useful because it means that if you want to make a mod to for example, I was talking about making pollution more realistic in the game. You can just create a mod in, in the programming language Lua, pop it into the game, and uh, you can then you know, begin doing optimization upon the game, thinking about pollution in a, in a more realistic standard. Um, so we create a mod um, which um, allows us to send packets through the network to Factorio and back. It's a bit of a downside here is that it's, um, it's slow to an extent because packets, even on a local network, you still have to navigate the sort of network interface. So it's, it's not the fastest thing. Much faster than a human, much faster than we could possibly do, but it's still not the fastest possible. Um, so the, for now, we're doing this, but we'll see how this goes. Um, the great thing about this is because we're doing this in Lua, um, the, the mod is in Lua. It means that you can actually communicate to it just through a text file which means that you can actually communicate with the game with any programming language that can manipulate a text file. Um, one of our biggest concerns with this project was, um, does this mean we have to code in Lua forever? Like Lua is fine, it's okay, but it's not, it's not a true programming language, it's a scripting language. Um, but we've realized now that we can actually work with anything. And we've got, we now have this working um, using Archon. Um, Archon stands for remote console. It's a library that's available within Python um, that already exists for Factorio. So what Ilya Merlavi did um, in our group, he created this interface mod in Lua and in Python. So we can use any optimizer that's external. It'll talk to the Python interface. Um, it's really easy to interact with. Um, we don't need to know any of the workings of Lua. We don't need to understand Lua at all. You can just write your optimizer in your standard language. So long as you have a fitness function and an optimizer, just the normal stuff, and you, and you have an input and output mechanism to the Python script, you can, you can optimize Factorio. And this means that we're, and the purpose we're doing, the reason behind us doing this is because we want to eventually open this up to uh, not just being our small team, but bringing on a lot of uh, people, other people who are interested, because like I said, this is a massive project. Um, so if somebody doesn't feel comfortable coding in Lua, they can still take part. And that's, that's a good thing. So a quick question about this whole interface. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't know exactly what's possible in mods, but um, can you turn off aspects of the user interface in the mod um, in order to speed up the game, right? To accelerate everything. So it's not taking the time to generate the graphics so, so it goes at a higher speed and thus evaluate quicker. You can, but I can do you one better than that. Um, mm -hmm. So in this slide at the very right-hand side, the last part I was gonna get to was uh, 
we Sorry, actually found okay. there's a headless version of Factorio that you can run that traditionally is used for as a server, so people can connect to and play multiplayer. Um, but we can use it just as a way of playing Factorio in a in a massively cut down version that's effectively just running you know code in the background with no graphical element at all. Um, and so, will it run faster because of that? Like, well, can you? Yes. Nice. Yes, much nice. faster. Um, so we found that there's actually a console command in game that you can run that tells it to increase the number of um, UPS, um, which is basically ticks per second. Um, it's the number of uh, processor ticks within the game that count as effectively game seconds. By default, it tries to aim for 60 ticks per second. Um, but you can increase that up to whatever your processor can handle. We managed to get maybe 250 um, out of our standard computers. Um, nice. But now that we have the, the headless Docker version, which by the way, we can now put on the HPC, um, we haven't tested the, 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 the ticks per second, but I, I estimate it'll be in the thousands, maybe tens of thousands, which means that instead of us having to wait 20 seconds for a test to run, we might have to wait 0.2 seconds. Um, I'm hoping that the thing that slows us down is the communication from the optimizer to Factorio and back, not Factorio itself. Um, we originally played via Steam, um, so that's how most people access the game. They, they go onto Steam, and um, this is a gaming um, sort of interface to, to access an, a library of video games. Problem with that is it has digital rights management, so you need to have purchased the game in order to have access to the game, effectively. Um, we learned as well, however, you can actually get the standard game without DRM, digital rights management, um, from Factorio.com directly. So you don't have to go through Steam, which is nice, because so you can actually um, have multiple versions running at the same time. The problem was that was graphical, and that's when we came across this headless version. Okay, so our design, design decisions summary so far, um, we decided to communicate with Factorio via a custom Archon-based interface. Um, we decided that we'll run Factorio in headless server mode to make it more efficient. Um, but what about the massive quantity of problems? We still have hundreds and hundreds of sub-problems that we want to solve. How is That's not really tractable from a research standpoint at the moment. So we decided we have to choose one. Um, we have to choose one that is a simple proof of concept for the project, ideally, just to prove that it's possible more than anything. Make sure that we can create the interface, make sure that optimizers can communicate, make sure that we can do it in a reasonable amount of time. Um, we want to make sure that it's reusable code-wise so that any of the future papers we work on can also you know, lean on the work we've already done. Um, and hopefully this interface will be that. Um, we'll be able to reuse the interface. We also want to use the actual solution as well. So um, some of the problems, like I said, lean on other problems. So I, we wanted to choose one that was kind of a, a building block, so we'll solver that other problems can lean on. Um, for example, if you're trying to think about scheduling employees, but you don't want to think about transporting them place to place, you can consider that out of scope. That's kind of the thing we're thinking of. We want to solve the most basic element possible first. So our first problem of choice, um, we've dubbed it the logistic transport belt problem. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a working title. Um, the idea is that you have these uh, customizable uh, belts that you place down on the ground in the game. They require no power, they're very easy to run, and you just place them down and they move an object from uh, one grid space to another. You can change the direction of them easily, like you can see on the screen. Uh, this is kind of a pointless one just for an example, but it's taking items out of a chest, placing them onto a transport belt, moving them around, and then putting them back into the chest. So as far as we're concerned for this problem, we don't really care about the elements in the middle, we're trying to only think about the belts and the placement of the belts. So we don't care about the, the, those robotic arms known as inserters, and we don't care about the chest. That's all out of scope and just part of the problem design that's um, handed into the, the optimizer to solve. So belts are these logistic machines which allow players to transfer items from place to place or places to places like that. Um, as well as transport belts, there are also objects known as splitters. They kind of saw this at the start of the presentation as well. Splitters allow you to, um, for example, on the left-hand side, we have a one belt turning into two belts, so the objects get split nice and evenly in half. On the right-hand side, we have a one to four. Um, you can also do it in reverse like that. And you also have multiple types of items. So at the top, we have railroad tracks. Then we have mining drills. Doesn't really matter what they are. Um, we have four different types of items that are being passed into this one track on the other end. And you can see they're getting perfectly ratioed, which might be a useful mechanism as well. This is kind of um, relevant to real world operational research as well, because think about uh, Amazon warehouses, um, think about 
uh, airports, right? When you go baggage collection, there's a lot of behind the scenes transport belts like this. Um, so it might be interesting to have a simulation that can do this kind of thing. Um, we also occasionally come across obstacles in the game. So if you have multiple objects that are placed, transport belts can't easily be placed from A to B in a linear fashion. Um, sometimes you have to go over, around, and sometimes under things. So what that big arrow is pointing at in the middle of the screen, that is uh, underground belt. So you can actually uh, allow, you actually pass items under the ground and other object under under other objects and uh, under other belts to pass objects around. So that's three types of objects I've mentioned. There's belts, there's splitters, and there's underground belts. To make it even more difficult, there's actually three speeds on top for each of those three items. So it's three times three. There's nine objects we care about. Um, there's yellow, red, and blue for the three different colors, for which are the three different speeds. And then there's the three different types on top of that. But what is the actual problem? Um, what, did this, what do the solvers actually solve in this paper that we're writing now? Um, we created eight different problems that are some are, they're all dynamic. Sorry, we made eight static problems and eight dynamic problems. Um, all of these problems have the following traits. They have obstacles, they have uh, varying sizes of grid. So you might have a hundred by a hundred so problem to solve, or you might have a one by 10. Um, you have a different number of inputs and outputs. So you might have one input passing one type of item, or you might have 10. Um, you have different placements of the inputs and outputs, so they're not always in the same location. And you have different object types and expected outputs as well. So you might pass in object A on the left, as well as object B in two inputs, but you might only have one output that's expecting object A and B, for example. Um, and these are sort of randomized through our dynamic um, problems, the eight different types that we have. And we also have uh, uh, eight different static problems. They're exactly the same every time, just for kind of showing that it works. And we hope that these will be used in the paper as a kind of exemplar of each of the problems. Um, we realized that because we have these um, nine different types of belts and we have four cardinal directions they can point in, north, east, south, and west, the easiest way to actually put all this into uh, for optimizers to solve is just to put it down as an integer matrix that represent different objects in the game. So the right three columns are belts, splitters, and underground belts of various speeds and cardinalities. The one on the left-hand side are the non-belt items that are like outputs, inputs, um, chests, and obstacles. This way that um, the, the solver can pass in just a configuration of numbers, and that is the solution. Factorial will hand back the information of saying, have we passed that successfully from A to B or from B to C or whatever? And uh, then the optimizer can run it through the fitness function and say whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Visually, that's what it looks like. On the right-hand side, we have uh, a sort of standard problem where we have um, obstacles all the way around. We have an input and an output, and we have no solution in place yet. That's represented on the left-hand side. Um, there should actually be a row at the top and bottom that are also minus ones. That's, that's an error in the slide. Um, but all these zeros are malleable and they can be changed to various belts, splitters or underground belts of any speed. Okay, we've now got a proper problem to solve. How do we, how do we define a, a good solution though? First of all, we have this idea of hard constraints. These are basically deciding whether the solution is feasible or not. Um, if any of these are, are, are failed for whatever reason, the entire solution is deemed infeasible, it's zero fitness, it's less than zero fitness really, it, we wouldn't even consider it. Um, don't worry too much with the maths on the right, uh, you'll see in the, hopefully you'll see in the paper eventually. Um, on the left we have the, the actual dis the description that matters. Um, you must define certain coordinates in the map. Um, there must be at least one logistic object placed. If a solution hands back nothing, it's not very useful. Um, and uh, also you can have multiple items placed in the same place at the same time. Sensible. Our um, solution quality is a bit more complex and more interesting. Um, so soft constraint one is minimizing the number of logistic items used. Um, cost is an important part of, of factorial. You have limited resources and it's very important to minimize the cost of anything that you, you create. Um, and soft constraint two is the minimizing the number of items not received in the output. In other words, maximize the number of out outputs, right? That's all that means. It's a minimization problem, so we had to rephrase it, but that's what that means. You also notice in the little, little equations at the bottom, we have W1, W2. Those are just weightings. 
So if you decide that um, you really want to, you're, you're re feeling really frugal and you have very little in the way of resources, you might weight soft constraint one to be very important. Um, so you might not find a solution that's, that's acceptable to you, but it means that you can um, make sure that if you, it makes sure that you can try at least in the right direction. Now, the problem with soft constraint one there is it's quite difficult to define cost of an item in Factorio. Um, and there's different reasons for this. So many items in the game require research and game to unlock. Um, so for example, if you want to do a blue belt, the fastest one at the bottom right there, you require 20 units of lubricant, 10 iron cogs, and one fast belt, which is the previous version, um, and 0.5 seconds to create it as well. The difficulty is if you've not unlocked oil cracking, you will never be able to make lubricant. That is completely infeasible. You will never, never be able to create that. So there's a huge cost in actually doing the research behind unlocking that item. So it's not just those materials on screen, it's probably actually more like 10 million iron cogs that would be created to unlock the research to do that. Um, items themselves have the raw material co cost as well that you can see on the right-hand side, of course. And some raw materials need research before being created as well. So um, there, there's a lot of difficulties in defining the cost of one of these items. Is it the actual cost? Is it the time cost? Is it the research cost? Um, so that's a very difficult way of thinking about it. We decided that this is kind of ridiculous um, because they're really out of scope for this problem. We don't really care about research right now. We're not trying to think about that. That's completely out of scope. Instead, we're hoping that the weighting can really control that. Um, an example is there at the bottom. So we might say, for example, um, inverse cost or fitness here, um, using a belt, a yellow standard belt is ideal, um, whereas using a more expensive fast or fastest belt at the bottom is less ideal and you'll get uh, penalized for that. However, if the fitness function at the end cares more about, for example, speed, which some of them do, we might prefer faster results and that's okay too. The cost is something that we need to consider at any point anyway. Okay. We've talked about how the quality of a solution. We've talked about the, the, the problem parameters as well. Let's actually think about solving this problem. What are we going to use to solve it? Um, our first sort of guess for this was, um, we don't really know the best way to do this. This hasn't been done before. There are, there are a number of, well, as you all know, there's a huge number of uh, search algorithms available. We decided to apply what we all, what we all know. So um, Stephen and uh, Ilya both know artificial regulatory networks. So they wanted to put that in place. I decided simulated annealing was a, a very common place algorithm that could be used as a benchmark. Um, we also decided GP and random search for a baseline. Um, our implementation isn't yet complete. So our only results so far are very preliminary. Um, however, we have got the random search now working and it has produced solutions that technically are feasible. Um, it takes a long time because we're still using the graphical approach right now. Um, getting the Docker image to work on the HPC has been um, difficult because uh, Docker is not actually supported. It's a third party software known as Singularity, which is um, very difficult to understand. So we're having some problems getting that in place. But um, that's what we have going. I was, going, I was thinking we're doing a live demo, but I don't, I don't think I'll, I'll bother because it's a, that's never a good idea. Um, <laughs> so the next steps are um, to finish the implementation of the fitness functions optimizers, convince the HPC that we're the people who work at the HPC that we're not playing games when we upload Factorio there, we're actually doing work. Um, we need to run our experiments as well and then submit this paper. And that'll be the preliminary part of the project done. And we'll see if that's of interest. After that, we want to seek funding because like I said, I think this is, I think the, the, the possibilities and opportunities presented by Factorio are tremendous in research, um, especially with operational research, but also with other interdisciplinary um, uh, projects that I mentioned. We also want to seek interdisciplinary colleagues for collaboration. I don't know anything about education or uh, psychology, so I would love to talk to people who are, are interested and have some qualifications in that area and are, and are interested in this research. I'd love to hear their points of view and um, see if we can come up with some kind of collaborative project that uses our interface with Factorio um, and you know can come together under this umbrella idea of a project across the, the, the various disciplines. We want to solve more of these hundreds of problems. I mean, we've, we've, we've already defined several of them um, in our, in our uh, initial idea. We've, we've marked down a few dozen idea, uh, problems that we want to solve eventually, but there are definitely hundreds more that we haven't yet considered. Um, 
We also eventually want to host a competition. Um, the idea is that if we've created a, this interface for various problems in the end, right now it's only for one, pro one sub problem, but if this interface can be expanded to all the various problems, all the decision making, all the train scheduling and so on, and you can then talk to Factorio from your optimizer through our interface without having to learn Lua and so on. Um, in theory, we could host a competition and tell people, so long as you modify this integer matrix, you can test it in the game and see how your algorithm compares to other ones. And that kind of competition, I think would be really good for um, a sort of introduction to bio-inspired computation. Um, and I think that'd be really interesting. We plan to seek funding to host a competition like that somewhere like Gecko maybe, because um, I think that could be really fun. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening today. Very much appreciate it. If you do want to talk to me about this collaboration and all that, um, there's my email address at the left-hand side. Um, and you can also contact me elsewhere from the stuff at the bottom right as well. Um, the code from this project is not yet on GitHub. Well, it is, but it's private at the moment. Once we've published it, we will make it open source and everything will be available and accessible. Um, but right now we're obviously keeping it uh, locked down just for, for now until it's you know workable and usable. Um, but again, thank you very much for joining. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I love the applause icon, it's great. <laughs> again, one question, um, how would you characterize the problems here that differently from say StarCraft, because StarCraft is the next step in game playing. Is this beyond that? Is it parallel to that? Is it somehow different in challenges that it provides? Um, I haven't looked into the StarCraft research, but I, I, I know the game. Uh, so I, I, can, I can talk to that a little bit. Um, I know that the, there are uh, artificial intelligences that are currently, I think, I think Google DeepMind is doing it actually. I saw a talk on that a while ago. Um, is actually climbing the ladder in Battle.net. It's actually playing against real people and learning, which is great. Um, this is not a competitive game, really. I mean, it can be, you can kind of force it that way. The purpose is really just survivability and optimization. Um, I think you can argue StarCraft has a lot of optimization in it because it's all about, you have resources and you are trying to optimize your, um, your base to an extent, but the majority of the game is based around combat. Um, Whereas this game, I, I see combat as almost a side note that might be turned off for this project. Um, so I think there will be some crossover and, and we should certainly read that literature and um, see, the, see the, 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 the similarities because I think we can learn from it, but they're definitely distinct problems. If I could jump in on that, I think one of the differences that I'm seeing is that in StarCraft, um, the individual things that you build for the most part um, in, um, act on their own. And yes, they might produce resources that you need elsewhere, but you don't have to worry about all the, the very careful uh, uh, conveyor belt, transport, everything moving exactly right in the same level of depth. There is still the elements of that, but it's, I feel like it's not anywhere near the same level with so many different resources all needing to get transported and all these routing problems. I think in StarCraft, you can find an optimal solution to the small space that you can place items quite easily. I think in Factorio, just because of the sheer quantity and volume of problems that are interconnected, I don't think it would ever be possible to actually get an optimal solution. Hopefully I can prove that wrong, but I don't think it is possible. <laughs> just to point it out to you, there are a couple of notes in chat also. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Oh, thank you very much, Alex. That's very much appreciated. I definitely will email you about that. Thank you. Or Matt, I'll email Matthew about that. Thank you, Alex. Um, so Ken, I'm kind of curious. Um, do you have any plans for like uh, outreach to the general public in terms of like YouTube videos or anything? Because I can see those doing quite well. Um, there's definitely an audience, I think, for all Factorio. That's a, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I, I did an initial post on Reddit a year ago with this idea just to ask, I, I sort of wanted to ask if it's been done already because I, I, I mm -hmm. didn't see any papers about it, but that doesn't mean some, you know, entrepreneurial professional gamer hadn't tried it himself. <laughs> um, and um, 
they basically they showed some interest. I got a few hundred of votes, and people seemed quite interested. But um, and they pointed out a couple of genetic algorithms have been used for very niche sub problems, but it's never been a point of research as much as it's just been a way of helping the assisting the player do certain things in the game, um, sort of tools to help you place things efficiently. Um, and I, I, yeah, thank you, Bryce. Yeah, it'd be great on Twitch. Um, I do have a Twitch channel, so that's a good idea. Um, right now, solving this belt problem looks really boring because all it does is place a bunch of belts, fast forwards the game, then deletes them all, and then it waits a second and repeats. It's very, it's very boring to watch at the moment. But yeah, eventually it would be, it would be fantastic to watch it try to do this. Gotcha. Thank you. And yeah, I do, I do think there is an interest. We also, we also reached out to Web Software, the company behind Factorio, and. Uh, they said they're very much interested and in to reach out once we've done some initial research. So once this paper is published, we'll probably get in contact with them. Um, we're hoping eventually to get sponsored by them, ideally. Um, talking with that competition, I'd love it if um, they provided keys to that game to any participants so that people can actually try it on their home systems without having to worry about headless versions and so on. I think that would be really interesting. Okay, if that's all the quite oh, one more in the chat. Um, Jason says, uh, I'm assuming the factory has a linear style to get from A to Z. You need to go. Um... Uh, yeah, you can absolutely do that. So uh, is, is it linear? Um, yes. I mean, technically, the game is not stochastic whatsoever. Technically, every single element is entirely deterministic. Um, However, I think linear has other elements though, because it's, you know, is there one way to go through to solve it or can you take different solution pathways? Exactly. Um, there are multiple, there are infinite pathways to get to the, well, probably not literally infinite, but there are definitely a huge number of, of possibilities. Um, and is it temporal? Partly. You can also do things in parallel. Um, if you think about any kind of system that has dependent components, um, if you're trying to produce more, but you don't have enough power, you'd eventually run out of power. So you need to keep lifting both of those two problems at the same time together. So you have to sort of concurrently solve problems. Um, but uh, you said the snapshot as well, though, uh, Jason, uh, you can take a snapshot. They're, they're safe games, right? You can just save the game and run from there. Um, so there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't hand into the idealized final optimizers. Um, the you know a save game and it optimizes upon that i imagine what it would do is probably delete everything though <laughs> honestly i mean humans generally there's a there's a running joke in the factorial community that um they call their bases spaghetti because all the belts are just sort of trailing everywhere going around other machines and you know an optimized um factory should have these beautiful straight lines where everything is you know almost like a circuit and that um, one of our one of our uh, collaborators actually mentioned that this is very similar to circuit design in the sense of trying to find that sort of optimal path making, and it's kind of similar to that. Okay, thank you again, again everybody. I really do appreciate it. Um, please do feel free to email me if there's if you have any interest in collaborating. Um, early stages. So it looks yeah. like Leslie uh, might have a question also. Yeah, there is one more question in the chat about testing economic assumptions with the game. Oh, sorry, the very top, I missed that one. Okay. Yeah, there, um, of course, in any uh, finite, uh, you know, place, um, unlimited growth is not going to be achievable. And so there, there is the uh, concept out there of having prosperity without growth um, and whether, you know, something of those principles could be um, tested through some variation of uh, the game and your system. Uh, I think that that um, could have a kind of a high impact factor uh, sort of publication result for uh, uh, economics journals, um, in fact. And certainly, I do not agree with the notion that uh, games are frivolous as far as uh, computer science research goes, because so much of computer science is based upon, um, you know, the the results of you know, the serendipitous results of people considering uh, issues of probability and gambling and gaming and so forth. 
I, I agree completely. I think um, I think games and game theory have, have are quite respected in the field, but I feel like video games are not. And uh, and I've talked to I've talked to people in conferences who sort of look down on on you know attending workshops or con or uh, presentations on video games, and that saddens me because I I just see them as simulations. But in terms of research, they're they're really great simulations. Um, but thank you very much for the idea with the, the economic side of things. I, I have to say I'm not familiar with that at all, um, so I will read up on that. Um, but that is very interesting, and uh, I never once thought that this project would go into economics. <laughs> It's really interesting. Okay, thank you, everybody. I really do appreciate your time today. Yes, thank you. For thank the you. Great that talk. was thank you. Too. That was fantastic. And uh, and yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, to seeing what comes out of this. And uh, personally, I think one of the one of the biggest uh, pluses of this is just having this well formulated system that other people can test all their algorithms on and, and uh, for optimization. And that's one of the big things, like the, to have systems that are this complicated, yet someone has taken the time to build an interface to make these things possible is just fantastic. Thank you. I really I really appreciate you recognizing that because that was one of the main end goals of this project is to make it accessible and, and sort of open source. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Charles. Okay. Have a lovely weekend, everyone. All right. Bye, everybody. Yeah.